everyone for coming this afternoon. Uh, my name is Ben Shear. I'm going to be providing short introductions for, and I don't think he needs a whole lot of uh, introduction for most of the people in the room, but uh, Professor, Hart Professor Hartle is uh, a, the Jack Family Professor Emeritus here at the Graduate School of Education. Um, the research that he's pursued throughout his career has studied a wide range of topics in assessment and testing, um, many of them informed directly by the evolving context in which tests and assessments are used uh, in schools and for policy and for accountability. Um, he has had way too many, too much participation in a number of uh, panels and boards, National Council of Measurement and Education, uh, National Governors Board, and things like that for me to list all of them. Uh, he's you know, chaired many committees, won many awards, published some very interesting research. You can look up uh, his CV online for more of that. Um, and the only personal thing I'd say is that we all feel very lucky that Ed, as he claims, is flunking emeritus and <laughs> continues to uh, share his expertise and his kindness with all of us. Um, I guess most relevant to is that he has been a part of the development of the California um, Accountability and Assessment Program since uh, before all the changes that took place with No Child Left Behind or NCLB. Uh, so he's going to talk about some of that work, particularly focusing on the, the, uh, the API today. Uh, and immediately following, I guess, about how long will the talk be? Uh, I don't know. It we'll, depends, on, depends on how much people have to questions. have to say and how much time there'll be for questions. I haven't timed it. So. Okay. So, um, and then there'll be a reception immediately following, so everyone can continue the questions and conversation afterwards. Uh, but on that note, if you could please join me in welcoming Professor Ed Hart. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ben. It's a, uh, and thank you for being brief. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I'm, um, I'd like to start by saying what the relation is between the TDG, your technical design group, and the PSAA advisory committee. I'm a member of both. <clears throat> PSAA is the Public Schools Accountability Act of 1999, and the PSAA advisory committee is created by law and charged with being an advisory committee, which means that it functions under rules that are called the bagley keene Act for open meetings. And that really hamstrings the committee in some ways. Uh, we can't discuss committee business between official meetings. The agenda has to be announced in advance. Materials have to be prepared a certain amount of time before the meeting happens. When we go through the agenda, there is a formula for <clears throat> asking for public comment in a finite amount of time after each agenda item, and so on and so on. <clears throat> the PSAA is, that said, a very important committee. It's advisory to the State Board of Education and the State Superintendent of Public Instruction. And, uh, and the Board of Education really does listen. They don't always do what the PSAA recommends, but, but that, that's fine. It's also a very useful committee for me because it's widely representative of different constituencies that are concerned with California's accountability system. And I learn things in those meetings that I would never think of, uh, just off in my cubicle playing with Excel or something. <clears throat> the TDG, our technical design group, is a much smaller, much less formal group. I wear a necktie when I go to the PSAA meetings and not when I go to the TDG meetings. Uh, the TDG is our technical design group is about uh, about a half a dozen people right now. It's, it's waxed and waned over the years. I'm the only person who's been a member of that committee since its inception in 1999. And I'm also one of only two members who's also on the PSAA committee. The other, Wendell Callahan, doesn't always show up for the meetings. And while well, he has very important input on a specific range of topics, especially around alternative school accountability model or ASAM schools, I do most of the the work in, in affording a conduit of, of communication between those two committees. TDG was created by Bill Padilla back when he was the director of the Office of Policy and Evaluation. That office no longer exists, but the functions have been shuffled about here and there through many reorganizations as the budget of California has waned and waned. Uh, uh, in any case, uh, the TDG it, it has issues referred to it by the PSAA also from the department. We work closely with the department back and forth. And we often will formulate recommendations, which we then take to the PSAA committee, which are vetted. There's more back and forth. And, and um, then from the PSAA, they go to the board. 
we try to maintain a fiction of a distinction between technical issues and policy issues. So the technical issues are the TDG's concern and the policy issues are the PSAA concern. But of course, there's never really such a division. And it's always slightly problematical if you don't have good communication between the technical folks and the policy folks. Uh, a case in point would be the National Assessment Governing Board, especially in its early years, but that's a different story. So, um, so that, that's the work of the TDG. Um, there are a couple of big ideas that I want to try to revisit as I go through some issues the TDG has taken up over the past few years. Um, one is that, uh, I, my notes here, I just said schools and districts as fixed effects. We can't ignore the weird cases, and there are so many weird cases. When we're doing re analysis of uh, data, large data sets for purposes of research, we can impute missing data, we can set aside weird cases and use definitions that are more constrained and more tractable. We can look at the, the big story first and not worry quite so much about the incidental cases. When you're developing an accountability system for the state of California, it has to apply to all the schools. There may be special rules and special provisions and exceptions, but one way or another, everyone has to be accommodated. And that, that makes things a lot more interesting. Um, uh, second, there are many active stakeholders. Uh, we can't, w the work we're doing is consequential, and you know, any technical decision is going to create winners and losers. There's simply no way to avoid that which means that the decisions have to be well-grounded in sound statistical reasoning or broad policy goals so that there's no appearance that anything is being done for purposes of favoring one group or one school versus another. Um, third, there's just a constant need for attention to the incentives that we're creating. Uh, the system is highly reactive and highly sensitive. It can turn on a dime, and if we create a loophole, the people will find it and exploit it. Uh, as the API growth became more consequential, uh, just a couple of quick examples. Uh, there was, under Pete Wilson, after some flap around the class system, a law was passed that parents had the right to opt their kids out of testing. Uh, some schools, uh, through their PTAs, sent postcards out to the parents of members of some demographic groups encouraging them to opt out. So their scores went up miraculously. So then we need new rules and new provisions to try to close that loophole. Schools don't get, a, for a long time, didn't get a, a growth API if the uh, CDS code, the county district school code, that 14-digit identifier changed. So there was a spike in new CDS code applications, and then we needed new rules to, you know, to stop that. It's just, it's, it's an interesting world. Things are, are happening all the time. And finally, uh, you'll see some examples as I go along of remarkably unexpected uses and interpretations of test data. Once these things are out there, once the accountability system's out there, the number, the index, what have you, it becomes an affordance that different actors will pick up and use for all kinds of purposes. Uh, it's a constant fight, not so much recently, but over the years, for the TDG to stop people from using something called the similar schools decile for all kinds of purposes for which it wasn't intended. It's not a good index. We don't like it. We've created it because the law says we have to have it. We did the best job we could. But, but, but that doesn't mean that it's a solid number that people can hang all kinds of purposes and interpretations on. And of course, that's what they're always trying to do. So I'm going to start by giving you a quick overview of the Academic Performance Index. And I'm going to do that by way of two retrospective uh, PowerPoints, one from 2001, a presentation I gave to the State Board of Education, and the second from 2004, a presentation I gave to Crest, which covers a little bit of the same territory but shows you how complicated things got very fast. The PSAA of 1999 created this new, envisioned this new system. Uh, the PSAA Advisory Committee was formed that year. The system was really sort of up and running by 2000. Then in 2001, NCLB happened, and things changed. More, more to be said on that. Um, I'm also going to sneak in a quick fifth uh, issue under my overview of the Academic Performance Index. It's just a quick email from last week to let you know that things are still moving. Um, the four issues are, are as listed here. If we don't get to the API indicator for college and career readiness, 
that's okay. I'm, I'm not sure how the timing is going to go. So, a uh, hopeful beginning. I'm going to start with um, this overview of the API. And as I say, this will uh, change. You'll notice on this slide that I'm identified as being uh, at the Sanford School of Education, Sanford University. Um, I noticed in the online flyer for today's talk that I'm now speaking in the Cirrus Leaning Center, L-E-A-N-I-N-G. So I was considering as an alternative to my announced topic just doing something on uh, multiple imputation techniques for missing letters, <laughs> but decided I'd stick with what I had been announced in advance anyway. Uh, so this is the um, basic scale for the API. One of the first decisions we made was what's the bottom, what's the top. Uh, Brian Stetcher at Rand said, let's not give anybody a zero. So the minimum has always been 200 points. And we humorously talk about the gift of 200 as the lowest possible assignment of points for various purposes as we go along. Uh, where the scale starts and ends is obviously arbitrary. The interim statewide performance target of 800 is one of a set of decisions which had been made by the time this presentation was made. This is not the very first presentation of the board. And that interim performance target was actually one of several different variables that we worked with together to get the system to work the way we wanted to initially. There was a lot of fine tuning and a lot of simulations that were done in the initial creation of the API using SAT-9, Stanford Achievement Test Version 9 data, from 1998 and 1999. Ed Wiley actually did most of those analyses. Some of you may remember him. Uh, one decision was where that performance target should be. Another was something called the progressive scoring weights. There were the rules for the performance targets for subgroups. All these things worked together in concert and were chosen and adopted as a package because in those early days under Gray Davis's uh, governor's performance incentive program, there were very large monetary rewards attached to high performance on the API. And because of that, we wanted to be sure that the system wouldn't have all that money going to the rich schools and wouldn't have all that money going to the poor schools. So the system was initially designed and tuned so that we would have a fairly uniform distribution of awards across the whole scale. Uh, in more polite terms, we wanted the uh, incentives to be ambitious but attainable for schools throughout the achievement spectrum. And we pretty much succeeded at that. The, the distribution was remarkably flat those first few years. And then, of course, the money went away and, and that became moot. Um, another quick aside, uh, that was announced and put in place when the SAT-9 was still being used every year. Um, and there's, anecdotally, the governor did not realize when these $25,000 bonuses for individual certificated personnel were announced that, in fact, the state was using the exact same test form every year. And, of course, the psychometricians were less than delighted on about a policy that would shine vast media attention on the extreme outliers in the score distribution. This is not a recipe for, for good public relations. Um, the interim performance targets are 5% of distance to 800. That's why the 800 mattered. And these growth targets, as you can see, create more ambitious growth or, or more, uh, or more, require more growth on the part of low-performing schools than high-performing schools. I'll come back to that because obviously we want gap closing. That's something we have to do. But there's a risk with that kind of structure of making the, the growth expectations impossible for the low-performing schools. So we'll come around to what we did about that in a moment. This is the basic structure of the API. Um, and there's a few things to point out. First, these performance bands. Uh, you see one through five there on the left. Initially, on the SAT-9, these bands are simply defined by national percentile ranks. 20, 40, 60, 80 were the cut points, creating five bands. Uh, this is a way of quickly and easily mapping the tests used at different grade levels and used at, uh, in different subject areas all into a common frame that we can work with. The information loss that comes from coarsening the initial test scores to the level of these five quantiles when we average up to the school level is vanishingly small. If we, we did simulations running a, a version of the API with continuous scores as opposed to the five bands, and at the school level, the, uh, the correlation was well over 0.99. You just couldn't see the difference. 
Okay, second, you'll notice these weighting factors, 200, 500, 700, 875, 1,000. You'll notice that the gaps down here are bigger. There's 300 points there, 200 points, and on, so, and on up. That, these, that's what we refer to as progressive scoring weights, and this did two things. First, it creates an incentive for schools to allocate resources toward lower-performing students. Because getting a student past one of these lower cut points credits the school more than getting a school past one of the higher cut points. The other thing that it does is soften the effect of those more ambitious growth targets for the low-performing schools. We're deliberately creating a nonlinear scale that has the property that um, it's easier to make progress for low-performing schools in terms of the numbers of points that they're moving uh, so that we, we're able to um, give everybody realistic targets and get their rewards to come out right. So this is the initial structure. We've got the performance bands, the weighting factors. We take the percentages of students in each band, apply the weights, add up. And then the next step is to apply these content area weights. 30% uh, for reading, 15% for language and spelling each, 40% for math at the elementary level. And we take a weighted sum of those pieces and we get the overall uh, base API. You'll see why it's called base API. That's not base as in evil. It's just base as in initial starting point. Uh, you'll see why we call it that in a few moments. Yeah. This is just one school. It's, 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 it's a, one hypothetical school. It's not the state, and it's not, uh, yeah, so. But a low-performing school. This would be a low yes, this would definitely be a low-performing school. Yes, thank you. Uh, here's a high school. Same thing, five areas instead of four. Um, then the next thing that the law required was comparable improvement for numerically significant subgroups. There were uh, eight subgroups created initially. Uh, the seven demographic categories or racial ethnic categories, uh, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, Filipino, Pacific Islander, American Indian, Alaska Native, and then we have the socioeconomic disadvantaged group. But the law did not say how to define socioeconomically disadvantaged, so we tried out some possibilities and, and came up with some rules. Um, so for each of these subgroups, if it's numeric big enough, then we're going to apply the same rule and get an API for that subgroup and see whether or not the gap closing or the growth is happening for the subgroups as well as overall. Um, this was problematical psychometrically because the more diverse the school is, the more uh, subgroups it has that are numerically significant, also the bigger the school. And this is a, there's a conjunctive decision rule. If a school has to meet the target for the overall school and also for the subgroups, then the more subgroups it has, the more challenge it faces in trying to meet the target. So to soften that, we initially proposed that the growth targets for the subgroups would be only 80% of the growth target for the school as a whole. That made sense psychometrically, but nobody, the policy people didn't like that initially. It seemed like we were somehow setting lower expectations for some groups than others, even though everybody's included in the school as a whole. But um, that was later abandoned, and the growth targets were 100% for the subgroups as well. Um, so um, I'm going to click through the rest of this fairly quickly. Oh, here. I mentioned base API. Um, you'll see here that in this plan going into the future, there's a base API for 2000 and a growth API in 2001. The label growth is unfortunate. We should have found some better thing to call this because it's still just a status measure. It's a cross-sectional measure that's calculated at one point in time. The actual growth for a school is gotten by taking this growth API minus the base API. The problem is that the API is not static. And the, each year we calculate two APIs from the same data. One is a growth API calculated according to the same rules as were used the previous year. The other is a base API calculated according to the rules that are going to be in place for the upcoming by overlapping biannual accountability cycle. So you see that base to growth here uses exactly the same tests, and, but this new base calculation, from both, these, both from the 2001 data, this one has these uh, new uh, standard uh, 
standards test, the California Standards Test in English Language Arts proposed. And then the CSTs in ELA are in here again. Then going forward, the, this, the 2002 base is going to use yet another additional test, the Mathematics California Standards Test, that's going to be incorporated going forward. So the tests are changing all the time, and the appropriate comparisons are always like to like, base to growth, within a biannual cycle, not base to base to base, because there the construct is changing. Uh, alas, no, uh, or thank goodness, no. <laughs> uh, the API right now has been suspended, and we're going to be making a fresh start, and I don't think there's going to be any serious efforts at linking old to new, although policymakers being policymakers, it's likely people will come up with something. Uh, the statute actually prohibits. prohibits linking old to new? Okay, that's great. <laughs> but not officially. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So just for the, for the video, David just uh, informed me that the statute prohibits linking of the old system with the new, which is, which is great news. It's, uh, so this is the, the overall structure, base and growth. Um, <clears throat> this is another example um, that shows the uh, additional calculations, future introductions, and so that's... 2001. The picture was still fairly simple. Fast forwarding just a few years, we're now at the uh, Crest Conference in 2004. And uh, I'm going to go fairly quickly through these first slides that just recap the way the API was calculated because um, it, it, you'll see pretty much what we had. Um, this was the foundation of California's pre-NCLB public school accountability system. We're now into NCLB. So by this time, we have the school reports that are, have the backside and the front side. There's an AYP calculation, adequate yearly progress, according to the NCLB requirements. We're still maintaining the old California accountability system as well. Uh, I remember Bill Padilla saying one of the nice things about NCLB was that it made people really like the API. Uh, so this was a reprise of calculating the API, um, initially based just on SAT-9 scores, content area weights, uh, progressive scoring weights for these comparison bands. Uh, when we moved and added the California standards tests, we kept five levels and gave them these names, far below basic, up through advanced, with these weighting factors. The, uh, these bands were, uh, calc were established by a judgmental standard setting process, and that's another topic for a whole day's rant, but we'll, uh, we'll set that aside for now. Um, we have the statewide performance targets. We have the uh, interim statewide performance target. The growth targets annually are 5% of the distance to that. Initially, schools above 800 did not require, didn't have to do anything as long as they stayed above 800. Later, they had to not lose, and still later they had to make at least one point improvement. Well, yeah. I'm probably going to get to this, but what are the psychometric issues versus just the, you know, choose, choose the weights that you, you feel are reasonable politically? What, what psychometric It's a great, a great question. Let's, let me get to two more slides, and I will say something about that. Numerically significant groups. Uh, this is the definition of numerically significant, which also is contested. Um, it defines which subgroups schools are accountable for. Um, so how the growth targets are defined. Coping with change, uh, Al Beaton, if you don't want to measure change, don't change the measure. Um, this is what the accountability cycle looks like. The first, the first psychometric issue is if you want to measure change, don't change the measure. The fact that the construct that we're measuring is changing over time. Um, and nobody really thinks very much about the API as an instance of measurement or the thing that the API is measuring about schools as a construct that defines what the school is, how well the school is doing. Uh, it, it's very much 
the focus is very much on the administrative aspect, the decision rules, the incentives, but in fact we're engaged in, in something like measurement. Uh, people don't get it that, or won't get it, that the only measurements we're making here are, are brief segments of two, account, uh, two waves of data according to the same rule, then two waves of data according to different rules, two waves of data according to different rules. Gray Davis was very concerned about the possibility that with this introducing these new tests, especially since the CSTs were supposed to be harder than the old SAT-9s, that the API was going to go down. And he didn't want political attack ads showing this graph that showed the test scores going down over time on, on his watch. So whatever else we did, we had to make sure that that wasn't going to happen. Um, so the uh, answer was something called the SCIF, for scale calibration factor. Initially, it was called the NIF, or neutral introduction factor. David Ragosa railed against that. It's anything but neutral. So scale calibration was the, the compromise. Um, what this does is it's just an additive constant that makes the base the growth from one year equal to the base for the next year. So the two calculations that are done using the same year's data uh, are set to have the same statewide average for each of elementary, middle, and high school. Now, once the SCIF was introduced while the technical design group's back was turned, the SCIFs mysteriously proliferated. And at this point, the current API calculations involve something like 14 SCIFs. Uh, I can't keep track of them all. But when there were changes that would affect some kinds of schools but not others, like bringing in the CAPA, the California Alternative Performance Assessment for the Severely Disabled Children, since that affected different schools differentially, and some schools would therefore have differential effects on their APIs, the department folks just added another additive constant to sort of average that out overall so that things stayed smooth. And then once these things are in there, you can't get rid of them. So the, compli compli the calculation has gotten much more complicated. So the psychometric problem is what, what's the construct and how do we avoid people simply taking numbers that look the same and in fact have the same name? We call it API year after year after year. We don't subscript it with API 2011 or growth API 2015. Uh, nine, we just say API, and so people naturally think it's, it's one thing. Um, here are some of the changes that have happened over time. Uh, I won't go through all of this, but we started with just the SAT-9. We brought in the, Cali the English language arts test. History, social studies, we dropped the SAT-9. We had the California high school exit examination, first just at grade nine initially for the pilot year. That was supposed to be just a pilot, but then Gray Davis announced that Anybody who passed the test that year wouldn't have to take it again, so we had to rush back and figure out what passing meant and do a standard setting with an inappropriate population. You don't need all of that. So. Uh, adding the CST science, um, we dropped the... You know, Casey comes in at higher grade levels. We add the, Calif the comprehensive achievement tests. We drop the SAT-9, uh, and so on. Future changes, we've, it's, it's gone on. Uh, in addition, because of NCLB, we had to assign uh, APIs to schools that initially were excluded from the system, uh, including schools that cut across the usual elementary, middle, high boundaries, because we have different rules for different grade levels. Uh, and we needed to take one basic change in the way the API was calculated, so that instead of content area weights, which worked well when we just had three through eight and everybody was taking the same tests, we now have uh, weights that are assigned at the pupil level uh, for different kinds of tests that uh, result in approximate content area weights like what we had before, but they're not, they can't be exactly the same for schools that are different grade ranges. All we, if we only have a science test for fifth graders, and if some schools are, three, are K5 and others are K6, the proportion of the students who are taking that test differs for one school versus another. So the construct, again, is different as we go from one school to another. Um, this are, these are the most common, not all of the grade spans, but the most common ones. You can just see uh, very quickly how, how much variety there is in the, in the system that we're trying to accommodate. Measurement requires imposing some uniformity, imposing some kind of common um, metric or standardized index and making things look alike even though they're different. And that's 
That's a constant challenge. Um, I mentioned parent opt-outs briefly. Um, we have different rules for testing accommodations and modifications. Accommodations result in valid scores. Modifications mean more severe changes that result in scores that can't be used for accountability purposes. The alternate performance assessment for the severely disabled children had to be brought in. Um, there are different rules for adult and student testing irregularities and decision rules for deciding which kind of testing irregularity something is. Uh, that basically means if kids are cheating, the scores get kicked out, but the school still gets an API. If the adults are cheating, the school doesn't get an API. Um, uh, mobility exclusions, uh, and on and on. So in impact of NCLB was massive. Um, and probably I should just skip through to the end of this and, and move on to my next. Uh, oh, this is important. An enormous behind-the-scenes effort is required to maintain this system. It's not just uh, defined by the tests and the manipulations of the numbers. It's also a social system. There's lots and lots of actors at different levels of the system who are doing their parts. And there's an education effort that's required. When we first defined the socioeconomic disadvantage to use data on, this, on the free and reduced, reduced price meal program, the data the first year were a disaster because those data had never been used for that kind of purpose before, and they weren't being reported well. After a couple of years, the data get better and, and the, the index improves. Um, so up to the minute, because there's not going to be an API this year, the question the legislature said that schools could use various alternatives for the different purposes the API is being used for, one of which was just the average API from the last three years. So the technical design group was asked, well, how do you calculate an average? We have three numbers. This sounds not too challenging. Um, the department's initial thought was to pool the data across three years, weighting according to the numbers of students. Um, and that was good because groups that hadn't, some groups that had not been numerically significant in a single year might become numerically significant when they pooled. Their biggest concern was how do we manage the scale calibration factors across these different years? What do we do to skiff? Um, after some discussion, we concluded that something much simpler was better because this is only a one-year temporary fix for, you know, to, to patch the system. Uh, you'll see in a few minutes what some of the different purposes these are used for are. But this is um, an email I sent last Thursday. I just highlighted a few. It's going to be too small there. Let me uh, jack it up a little bit. That's good. Um, First of all, we need to give people three numbers. They need a base API, a growth API, and then the gain, which is the difference. Um, we need to base those on different sets of school, of school years so that the different scores is, in fact, an average of valid differences. We need to have decision rules for missing data. We need to calculate absolute deciles and similar schools deciles. I'll get to those in a few minutes. Um, we need to have different rules for missing data depending on which school years a school doesn't have an API for. Basic rule being that we are, the base and growth have to come in and out as a pair that are calculated according to the same rules. Then after all that, we also need rules for uh, growth targets so we can say whether schools have met their targets or not. And we need to worry about how subgroups will be defined, which will be in and out. Uh, I recommended an unweighted average across years because we have a couple of arguments. One would be the more recent year should get more weight. Another would be the years when more kids were tested should get more weight. There's no obvious way to do this, but what a principal is going to do with the, is add up three numbers and divide by three. And we want to give them a set of rules that will give them the same answer. So uh, all this very quick. I hold these thoughts lightly and welcome suggestions. And that's um, another half hour spent on the API. Uh, well, it's just, I don't think that it's a particularly good idea. Uh, it's in the legislation. So AB 484 says this is one of the things you might do. If you have to have an API, then it just rolls on down. The legislative aides tell the 
department and the department. What's that? Go on. Ah, good question. Let's let's look at some of the reasons why we have to have an API. Um, actually, uh, we'll get to that soon. But uh, it, but but the, the short answer is that the API is used for an amazing range of different programs. The API is used to define the API decile ranks, and those deciles are used for everything from charter school uh, reauthorization to eligibility for a teacher education loan forgiveness program, mortgage assistance, uh, funding of school health centers, uh, lots and lots of references to the API in legislation. Once it's out there, people grab it and use it for all kinds of wacky things. And so the legislature says, well, there's various things you can do. Use some other data instead. Use the previous year's API. Use a three-year average. And since they mentioned three-year average, then it all sort of sets a train of things in motion that end up with our figuring out how to do that. Lorraine McDonald, uh, in a talk some years ago, made the observation that in the form writing of legislation, there's very little scope for technical expertise to enter in. Uh, the horse trading in the heat of the moment is just too fast and too uh, remote to, to really have much input. But once the legislation is written, once we have the law, there's ample scope for the technical experts to come in as fixers and figure out what to do with this and how to make the best of it after the fact. And that's really what we're doing here. We, we, there's a rule that says you have to have it, so then the question is, what's the, the best way to do that? And that, that's the technical design group's typical sphere of, sphere of activity. High school graduation rate. Um, I could have put decile ranks next. That may have made more sense, but I don't want to try to rearrange things now or I'll get really confused. So, uh, the, There's a law that says high school graduation rate has to be made part of the API as soon as feasible. That law was written in 1999. Uh, API graduation rate is, was, has been required to be part of the API as soon as the state superintendent of public instruction determined that the data available were sufficiently reliable and valid for that purpose. And the legislation, legislature, after 15 years, was getting impatient and finally actually gave us a timeline. And in addition, there's a law that says that the high school API, after this year, must be based on at most 60% star test data and at least 40% other kinds of indicators. And grad rate is the obvious leading contender. The current thinking is we may go to 20% on the graduation rate, 20% on college and career readiness, and 60% on test scores. So there's, there's an incentive to try to bring the API in. Another psychometric concern, if we don't want to change the construct, uh, and a lot of people don't, how are we going to um, maintain the current act meaning of the academic performance index and also satisfy the requirement to bring in the these new kinds of measures. The um, name academic performance index as a unitary single number is in, led, in law. We can't get away from that. But the initial proposal was to have three different sub-indexes of API G, API A, and API D for graduation, dropout, and academic. The API A would be like the, origin, the current old API We'd take some weighted average of those three to get the overall unitary API for accountability purposes. APIG, the API graduation rate, would, was initially conceived as being on the same 200 to 1,000 scale. We calculated it by giving 200 points for non-graduates, people who did not, four years after grade, uh, grade 9 entry, failed to graduate, and 1,000 points for people who did. This is the same as the way the KC is done. It's 200 for not passing the KC and 1,000 for, for, for passing for each of the, um, the two, uh, the two KC sub subscores for math and English language arts. Uh, however, the KC is just buried in the API, and nobody ever looks at the KC component by itself. When people looked at the API G proposed to be calculated in this way, the, it was immediately noticed that a graduation rate of only 75% would map to an API G of 800. An API G of 800 is the performance target. 
and people were horrified at the thought that uh, you could be an 800 on the API with only 75% graduation. So I was blindsided by this. The scale that we had created and the interim performance target and so on had worked just fine for its initial purposes, but it had taken on a life of its own. And people are really, really attached to that 800. And I could not, and in many conversations in the PSAA committee, they can't be shaken loose from that. 800 is supposed to be the goal, the target, doing good. And so we have to somehow or other make that come out to be good. The initial uh, efforts involved setting, uh, using some kind of curvilinear mapping from the graduation rate, percent graduates, to the 200,000 scale. And we, the initial thought was that 800 should correspond to something like 98% graduation rate. Well, some of you may see the problem with that immediately. Uh, it has to do with standard errors. Uh, let's suppose we have a high school that's got 200 12th graders. That's a reasonable sized high school. It's toward the small end, but far from the smallest. Uh, if there's 212th graders, then a change of one student from graduating to not graduating or back changes the graduation rate by one half of 1%. If 98% is 800 and 100% is 1,000, then one student not graduating changes this API G component by 50 points. And so it's just wildly unstable, unstable. And even if we average that into the overall API with 20% weight, it, it just caused the standard errors of the API to explode. So that was, clearly was a non-starter. As an unhappy compromise, we backed off to, um, I'm going to skip this fun with scaling. Well, I'll show you quick, but it's, it's just, no, I won't. It's an, it's an Excel spreadsheet. Anybody who's taken a course with me has seen me with playing fun with sliders and Excel spreadsheets. This one shows little graphs with different possible ways of mapping the percent past, uh, graduation rate onto the 200 to 1,000 scale. Uh, they all have a bends, and then we decide where the bends should be. But, um, the uh, compromise was to set 800 equal to graduation rate of 90%. This is, in fact, above the state average. The state average graduation rate, this is not the proportion of graduates overall, it's the average across schools of the school's graduation rates, is about 76.1%. Um, so the... Um, There are about 7.3% of high schools that have graduation rates of 50% or less. Those are mostly special purpose high schools. They could be uh, juvenile court schools. They could be recovery schools, uh, regional vocational centers, different kinds of special programs for special populations of students. But, of course, they all have to get an API. Um, the... Um, so there were second thoughts. Um, this was the uh, methodology we proposed. I'll uh, move from December of 2011 to February of 2012. By March of 2012, we, were, um, we proposed that the PSAA committee rescind the action, the formal action they had taken at a previous meeting. And I'm just going to fast forward to the more or less final resolution that we came up with. Um, which looks a lot like the um, original 200 and 1,000 version, except that it's now just a component of the API, and not a separate subscale. So these are um, some reasons why the approach that we'd looked at wasn't going to work. ASAM is Alternative School Accountability Model Schools. For a happy period of time, we had an ASAM along with the API. The alternative schools, accountability schools, had their own set of rules, their own committees and subcommittees, and their own numbers, and everybody sort of happily coexisted. With the funding cutbacks, the ASAM went away, and it's not going to come back. So the API is now facing the challenge of more rules and more ways of bringing in these special schools. Um, so the... Um, Here's the, uh, where we stand more or less right now. Four-year graduates with diploma, 1,000 points. Uh, Non-graduate, 200 points. But GED, 800 points with a, a footnote that if the GED is in fact revised and made more rigorous as is planned, 
then we'll revisit the 800 and maybe move it up to 1,000. And right now, I think the special education certificate, which is not a regular high school diploma, but it's given in lieu of a diploma for students uh, with special uh, students with disabilities, uh, is, is getting 800 points. But there's been some back and forth on that. And it's not clear what that committee, the committees that are relevant to that issue, are going to end up wanting. Uh, one can ask, is this a matter of construct definition? I don't know the answer. Suzanne? So what about, and maybe this is just 12th grade, but what about uh, kids who really need you know, skip school between 9th and 12th grade? How, how are they considered? Uh, that's another whole topic, and it's one that we have dealt with. Uh, it depends on what uh, exit codes are assigned. One problem is that when a student changes school, so there's now, there are now two different exit codes for voluntary transfer and involuntary transfer. And for a voluntary transfer, the uh, sending school is not, not responsible if someone simply opts to leave. For an involuntary transfer, if they assign the school, the student some other program, they are responsible. Um, but it's the receiving school that gets, that, that gets uh, charged, if you will, if that student fails to graduate on time. Some districts are using the voluntary transfer versus involuntary transfer code disproportionately, and there's no incentive to get them to use the code differently except gentle cajoling and remonstrance. So that's been a, a sticking point, and it's, we're not sure how it's going to be resolved. It's a matter of trying to improve the data. Um, and it's uh, beyond that, there are rules for transfers within districts, between districts, out of state. Uh, it just depends on what, and, and which exit codes leave someone in the denominator and which ones don't. So it's anywhere you touch this system, if you look, you know, peek under the curtain, you find this whole odd you know, area, of the, more stuff and more rules. It's, so it's, it's everywhere. There were three um, ways that this initial 200,000 thing were tweaked. One was to add these intermediate categories for, for intermediate sorts of outcomes. A second was for the ASAM schools, schools that were under, under the alternative school accountability model, the weight for the graduation rate component in the API will only be half what it is for the other schools. Now long ago, and initially when we had content area weights, they had to add up to 100. And there was always this agonizing discussion of where do we take the weight away from when we put something else in. So the TDG uh, made life easier for everybody by saying, you don't have to take weight away, from, weight away from anybody. We'll just add more weight. So now there's different weights for different things. We just take a weighted average, and we bring something else in and give it its weight, and, and nobody really worries about the fact that the total of all those weights is no longer has any particular relation to the number 100 or 1. Uh, so the ASAM schools will get half the weight on the graduate component that the others do. The third change was bonus points. Uh, schools get extra credit for graduating students in various special categories, and these are additive. English learners, students with disabilities, and socioeconomically disadvantaged students, uh, for each of these three designations, you get an extra 50 points if the school graduates, which theoretically boosts the maximum API over a thousand, so there's a cap on the school level API. That's really not, turns out not to be a concern. Everybody was happy with this uh, when we left the meeting, and then Christina Keitel, one of the members of the uh, TDG, uh, sent an email around saying, wait a minute, we have these subgroup APIs, and everybody in the EL subgroup, or everyone in the students with dis disabilities subgroup, or the SED subgroup, is going to get 50 bonus points. So that's going to make it look like we're closing gaps when we really aren't. We can't, uh, since we, we, we can't, uh, we don't want to give an appearance that the subgroups are doing better relative to the school as a whole by, by this, uh, this, this ruse. So the compromise was that the bonus points are added for purposes of the school level API, but not the subgroup APIs. So just an, another wrinkle. This gets farther and farther away from test theory and psychometrics. Uh, but it's, it's, it's the way this world, this world works. And again, the, the problem is always with, with the incentives. Um, 
a couple of quick postscripts. Um, the weight for the special education certificate is still being debated. Uh, it turns out that the person who seemed to be speaking for the relevant committee wasn't really speaking for the entire committee when we got the word that it was supposed to be 800. Um, and it also appears that uh, pursuant to the governor's uh, policy concerns, we're going to add a fourth category for bonus points for foster youth. So the maximum points for one student graduating could be 1,200 instead of 1,150. Uh, so these are all fairly benign kinds of changes to the API because graduation rate is of the essence for a school's academic mission. We still are really looking at academic performance when we bring in graduation rate. But over the years, we've had to push back on well-intentioned proposals to bring all sorts of other things into the API. We have this incentive structure out there, and people want to capitalize on that to, to advance their own particular missions. So various ideas have come for the different things we could put in, and the answer generally has been, this is one part of an indicator system, potentially. The indicator system has to have relatively pure measures of different things, and we're not doing anybody any good if we just mush them all together. You'll see um, an example of that from the other side when I get to alternatives to the decile ranks in just a moment. Um, there are two kinds of decile ranks that are mandated by the PSAA, absolute performance and, and performance relative to schools with similar characteristics, which gives us the similar schools rank. Um, there's a nice piece of work that the TDG did in a report for, that's published in 19... 1999, I think, on the similar schools uh, ranks. Uh, the more than you want to know link I'm going to skip in the interest of time, but it, it, it's a link to that report, which, will, which is also available online. The um, essence of the, to, to define schools with similar characteristics, we dutifully did the obvious things first, like looking to see if we could actually find schools with similar characteristics. And of course, you for some schools you can, and for some schools you can't. And since we have, have to have a system that works for everybody, we, um, we retreated to using regression analysis and, and working with a, a composite measure that maps everything onto one scale. The things we had to look at were listed in legislation. Not all of them made sense. Uh, some, like staff attendance rate, are particularly strange, but it's in there. Some were essentially collinear, uh, so we had to just use com there's some tweaking to put things together and form composites a priori that, that end up having the same weights with opposite signs uh, de facto. The um, way that the school characteristics index was created was to take all the school, it's done annually every year, and there's a new one, begin with the um, actual APIs and with this long list of, of predictors. Uh, which are mostly demographic things that are out of the school's control, and come up with a predictive equation that maximizes the correlation between the composite and, and the API. Then we set the actual APIs aside and just work with those predicted values and sort the schools according to their, those values. And you have what we refer to as floating comparison bands. That terminology actually goes back to uh, much earlier days in, in the state, back to the California assessment program, CAP, with Dale Carlson. Uh, it avoids, it keeps things smooth, which is always a good thing. We don't avoid sharp disjunctures. If we had, say, quintiles, then when schools move back and forth across the boundaries, their rankings would change drastically. So the floating comparison band for every school, except for the bottom 50 and the top 50, is just that school, along with the 50 that are closest above and below to that, to that school's own a predicted API, and then we um, uh, simply look at the observed APIs for that set of 100 schools and find out what the percentile rank of our target school is relative to the schools that are, are most similar in, their, in a way that refers to their predicted performance. Like everything in this world, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, one of the best predictors of students' achievement in the API is parent education level. In fact, that's the best single predictor we have, not surprisingly. Um, the state uh, gives parents an option of decline to state as a valid parent education level. We can't force parents to tell, disclose that. 
And in some parts of the state, uh, especially Southern California, some parts of Southern California, there's a lot of resistance to providing any data like that. So there are some schools where there's a very high percentage of missing data on that most critical value. So what we have is actually a blended regression model where we do two regressions, one with uh, parent education level, one without. And then we take a weighted average of those two predicted scores, the weights being a portion of parents for whom we do versus don't have that information. That's actually not statistically optimum, but it's close enough and it's easy to explain. So that's what, And nobody's ever asked us why we don't do something better. So that's a... Uh, if you think about it, what we're doing here is creating, uh, we're getting a percentile rank for each school based on its own customized norm group of only 100 schools. A norming sample of, norming population of 100 is pretty small. And these ranks are pretty unstable, even going to the level of deciles. It's deciles because in, when the original, original legislation was crafted, some people wanted a ranking from highest to lowest, and other wiser uh, voices prevailed saying we don't want to stigmatize any school as the worst in the state this year. Let's just do it by tenths and that's close enough. So that's where we are. So we have our similar schools ranks and we have our absolute deciles. What are they used for? Um, well, first of all, why do we need alternatives? People don't like the decile ranks because they consign 10% of the schools to being in the bottom decile. Uh, <laughs> duh. <laughs> uh, the deciles are used for a lot of, of pur purposes. Um, the legislature said, I'll, I'll show you why. This has to do with the scale calibration factor, the SCIFs and the overlapping biannual API cycles and so on. That's another story we'll get to in a moment. Um, we're required to come up with alternatives by last year. Um, there are at least 25 education code sections ref reference decile ranks. This is what I was referring to, Susanna, when I said I'd show you what these things are used for. Funding priorities, charter school reaccreditation, the SARC, um, uh, the Apple program, uh, Williams requirements, the legislation on, uh, where the state was sued for not providing a basic education for the poorest students. Uh, open enrollment rules, teacher loan, home purchase programs, mortgages depend on, on the de school decile ranks. So once it's out there, people will grab it and do all kinds of things when you're not looking. Um, this is a quick summary of how this is done. Another little wrinkle that I didn't mention about the small schools. Um, this is a chart that, well, for one thing, it's an engaging optical illusion. If you look at the scale on the left there, like here's 700. You look at the numbers on the right, this is 722, 750. You'd swear that it's somehow or other tilted and it's not on the same scale. I actually I put a ruler up on top of this thing on the screen and convinced myself that 600 actually does go straight across, etc. But more to the point, it's showing you that a school that with a 750 API in 2011 was at a level that would have put it in the eighth decile. Uh, back in when, when the API was initiated. Now, this makes it look like schools are really have made a lot of dramatic improvement over the last uh, 12 years. And I believe they have made some improvement, but not this much. The thing is that when you add a new test to the API, when you first put stakes on something, people start paying attention to it and scores go up. And with the skiffs year after year, we ride up that initial boost, and then we lock it in with a skiff, and we go on to add another test to the API, and we ride that on up, and we lock that in with another skiff, and so on. So we have a system that's made up unintentionally with a great deal of inflation built into the API. And that's an unfortunate fact. Uh, it, the, the, the fact that the name stays the same and the fact that people want a longitudinal index trumps the fact that we, you know, with, with our faint voice, keep saying, no, just compare base to growth. Don't try to go base to base to base because people are necessarily going to do that. So this is the motivation for the, um, for wanting to get rid of the deciles. Deciles are unfair because these schools are doing so much better and they're still being penalized as if they were still doing as badly as they were a decade ago. Um, so some rationales. Um, 
uh, know a better way of identifying who's actually still low performing. There are fewer low performing schools than there used to be. So goes so goes the argument. Um, these are some proposals that the uh, state came up with initially. These never got to the PSAA. These were just proposed to the um, TDG uh, April 18th. Uh, and I'm going to get back to the, um, I'll show you what, what actually happened five days later at the PSAA meeting. The, uh, the staff at, in the Department of Education really scrambled to redo this. So alternative method one, just pick some numbers and, and just use the same fixed numbers over time. That would be okay if, in fact, the fixed numbers had a fixed meaning, but they don't. A three by three matrix based on current API and um, improvement, one year, two year, and so on. This was one of my favorites, uh, but I didn't see it. It didn't seem very professional somehow. Uh, <coughs> uh, so this would be a way of, we could give this to the legislature and say, use this for your Apple program and your home mortgages and so forth instead of, instead of these decile ranks. Uh, it's a thought. Uh, more seriously, we could you know, display the same information differently with A through, a through F. Um, another system would be multiple indicators. This is this infatuation with dashboards. Um, so we could have lots of different kinds of graphics and so forth and a very complicated sort of table that would show how the school is doing with respect to lots of dimensions. Um, and there's different variations on this. Um, mapping through different point structures to an A through F scale. Uh, if it works for Florida, why not California? Um, so those are some of the possibilities. The PSAA, uh, actually I recommended that we consider a system with just three numbers. Um, I, my argument was that if gardeners can keep understand three numbers to describe fertilizers with NPK, uh, then legislators ought to be able to manage three numbers to describe schools. And for different purposes, different numbers might be relevant. My proposal was that we have one number that simply refers to the absolute level of disadvantage or the ed educational challenge. Just use a version of the school characteristics index, the SCI, probably a different calculation with a smaller set of, of, val of values so that's more sensible. The second number would be the absolute level of achievement, something like the current API decile, but probably not deciles because they now have a bad name. And the third, but, but relative, because we know we don't have a fixed scale for achievement that, that, that is going to persist over time. And the third number would be growth or improvement or just the, our standard base to growth comparison. And those three numbers could be used for different purposes. If you're looking for rewards for high-performing high schools, look at growth. If you're looking for where to allocate resources for, for health centers, look at absolute need and, and so forth. Um, the proposal got morphed into something more complicated. Uh, so this is now the PSAA meeting um, review of how this is done, where the how it's being used, purposes, uh, alternatives. TDG came up with a different alternative. We recommended multiple alternative methods with just these three pieces, absolute challenge, absolute performance, greatest challenge, and improvement, as I just described. Uh, the department didn't like those ideas, but thought that more was needed. So after the TDG meeting, five days later to the, the PSAA, what they actually presented was this and more. They added... Uh, in d different measures for subgroup achievement, uh, whether schools had made their performance targets over a longer span of time, high school graduation rate, and they also said whatever was done should be easy to communicate and understand. Uh, those are all good things. But um, we have a little bit of mission creep here. We had one decile rank, one number. The legislature was happy to use that for 25 different purposes. So, uh, this is sort of an abundance of riches, but it's, it's going beyond what was hoped for. Um, this is for the PSAA Advisory Committee to discuss. It went back to the um, TDG again. Two months later, we ended up with something like this. There's now, in addition to these original three, educational challenge, absolute value, and change in API, we have these um, gaps, 
and relative to uh, within the school between English learners and, and non-English learners and with, between students with disabilities and, I'm sorry, socioeconomically disadvantaged and not socioeconomically disadvantaged. And we also have uh, gaps comparing each of these two groups to the uh, average for the district, the county, and the state. And this is so highly redundant. I, I, I don't understand why anybody would want that, but I'm only one member of a committee and one listens to people and takes up other members' suggestions and we go forward with that. Um, so the, um, this is a bit on how we do this absolute educational challenge. It's basically a recap of the similar schools methodology but with a smaller set of variables. Um, and that was all done. And I'm not, I'm not going to spend any more time on those alternatives. Um, so this was the um, This is enough said for this. Oh yeah. How do I get out of this? There. Thank you. Um, this is still a work in progress. I'm not sure where we're going to end up. I hope that we can come up with a simple system with two or three numbers that can be used for different purposes and actually do capture different attributes of schools. So that would be moving back toward a more psychometrically grounded idea of having knowing what the construct is and how we want to measure it. High school API for 2014. Time is really short. I want to stop for Q&A, so I'm going to run through this very fast, just give you the, 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 the punchline. Uh, for this coming year, it looks like there will not be an API for elementary and middle schools because there simply are no tests. For high school, there still is a possibility, uh, a thin hope that we might still have an API for high schools based only on the 10th grade science test and the Casey, and maybe just a tiny bit on the Kappa. So this is, I dubbed this API light and the name stuck. So you'll be hearing about whether API light is a good idea or not. The initial, uh, the first, the, the TDG, when it's asked to consider something, takes it up in a, a conscientious way. So obviously the first step was to see how good a job could we do with this much reduced set of indicators of replicating the current full-blown regular API. So we did a multiple regression predicting the current API using this impoverished set of indicators. What do you suppose the uh, correlation was between API light and API? 0.97. Yeah. Oops. How do we explain to the PSA advisory committee that even though this thing correlates almost perfectly with the old score, it's still not a good idea? So that's the first step. The second step was, well, let's look at change. And this was a more, so there's a couple of versions of looking at change scores based on API light versus change scores year to year based on the full bore API. And there the other correlations come down to about 0 0.63, 0 0.64, 0 0.67, depending on how you do it. So that's a much better story to tell. It clarifies why the difference. Um, and the question came up from some staff members, why would there be such a difference? Uh, and this is sort of the basics of the reliability of a difference score. When we have the single point in time API, that number is capturing all of the stable demographic differences between schools. When you take a growth score, a gain score from across two points in time, everything that's common to those two points in time is subtracted out. What we're left with is just the change. And those changes are much, much, uh, have much, much smaller true score variance than the than the overall uh, API. So then the last step in the story was how we created some graphics to communicate this difference to the uh, PSAA advisory committee. And happily, the presentation was effective and they unanimously and strongly recommended against a high school API. And I believe the state board has acted on that now. So I think we're not going to have one. But uh, I was caught up short by that 0.97 correlation. I should have known. But, uh, these things matter. Uh, college and career readiness. Uh, there's, I, I, have a I was thinking about this recently because I was asked to record a five-minute video clip, and this was my topic. Thank you, Susanna. And it was actually a, gr a great question. I appreciate it, and it helped me to clarify my own thinking about what's, what the challenges are here. Um, the biggest, the first problem is that um, 
college and career readiness is a nice phrase, but it packages together things that don't really belong together. We tend to do that in the policy world. Take STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. As, as Helen Quinn has pointed out to me, no, nobody is a professor of STEM. You know, it's, we've put these things together, but that doesn't really mean that it corresponds to the way in which the disciplines are structured or the way curriculum or instruction necessarily should be, should be structured. There's earlier examples, higher order thinking skills, 21st century skills. Now, what on earth is that? So we're stuck with college and career readiness. That's one problem. Another problem is that we're pushing accountability to older, to older and older kids. There's a lot more uniformity, and it's a lot easier to define our constructs in, in a uniform fashion when we're looking at, at elementary school, where everyone's learning pretty much the same thing. But as children get older, they specialize more. Already, for high schools, the API rules are very complicated around the alternative mathematics courses and science courses that students can take. Uh, NCLB keeps things simple. They, says it ha they say it has to be a universal indicator, so we have to use the Casey because it's the only thing everybody takes. Uh, but for the API, we have a much more complicated uh, palette of possible tests and, and, and outcomes. When we go beyond K-12 into community college or higher education and even beyond that into students' uh, careers, the diversity is even greater. The only way around that is to come up with some kind of framework that allows for alternatives. Uh, and this is what the current framework looks like. This has been approved in principle by the, uh, by the PSAA Advisory Committee. And it really is just a different kind of envelope for a, an API component, a different kind of structure or container that we can use, where it's called College and Career Indicator with, with multiple measures, student data from CalPADS for your cohort. Um, and the measures are just called measure one, two, three, four, five. Here it could be dot, dot, dot. There's actually many more than that. There was a confidential version of this that was mocked up with some actual things we might use, like satisfying all the A through G requirements or only the, the mathematics and science ones and on down, and uh, different kinds of certificates for different kinds of certificated uh, career preparation programs uh, and lots of other options. The idea would be that there'd be multiple ways of satisfying any one of these measures at the top level, and the student would get 1,000 points. If none of those, then you drop down to the next level. If any of the different possible criteria are satisfied at this threshold, then 800 points, and so on and down to the gift of 200 if none of these, these met, uh, is met. The idea being that this would give students different possible ways of, of, of satisfying a college and career readiness uh, requirement and would allow for some flexibility. One, what we're doing when we create something like this is, as a matter of policy, uh, saying these different outcomes for our per policy purposes are going to be regarded as equivalent. We're creating a mapping of possible patterns of performance across a very complex space onto a continuum uh, where we're seeing different things that map to the same point in the continuum are being treated as being of equal worth. Now, that there's a real serious risk if we try to do this at the individual student level, that students are going to simply look for the easiest way out. And that's probably is happening already with students who take one high science course versus another to satisfy the A through G requirements. But taking a course, because it's an easy course, is probably, as opposed to out of inter genuine interest, is much less consequential than making some large career-related decision that could possibly send a student on some trajectory that was less than optimum. At the school level, I think those incentive effects are much less serious. Initially, this system would be very skeletal, very sketchy, but having this in place would create an incentive for different possible career paths, different kinds of uh, uh, proprietary technical training schools and so forth to come up with and have approved structures for accreditation, for uh, certifying their graduates that could then be folded into this in the future. It would require a lot of tweaking, and it would be a, a complicated thing. It would require a lot of adjustment over time. But at least it's a possible way forward. So that's, uh, that's where that stands. I'm afraid I've only left about 10 minutes for questions.
They have not. No, 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 no. No, the, the, the PSA Advisory Committee has adopted this framework in principle and has commissioned papers on different possible indicators that could be used. But that might be a simple Conceivably, but not as, as just one possibility. That's much easier for the college side. The career side is where things really get sticky. Uh, for we know that college readiness involves a lot more than just academic performance. There's things like time management that become much more critical because of the way that life in college versus life in high school. But in fact, there's a lot of ways in which doing well in high school is a lot like doing well in, in college. And we have decent measures of how well kids do in high school you know, through things like grade point average. And the best predictor of how well someone's going to do in some setting is how well they've done in that kind of setting in the past. So I think for college readiness, we're actually in pretty good shape. The under, construct underrepresentation, the things needed in college that aren't being measured, are unlikely to cause too much trouble because where construct underrepresentation matters is where it leads to a narrowing of the curriculum. If we only test certain things, if we only test uh, learning outcomes in certain ways, there's an incentive to focus instruction just on what's tested. I don't think that using the existing measures in the API for this purpose of defining college and career readiness is likely to result in even less time being spent on time management skills in high schools than is now. I just, but it, does, it seems like a low risk. Um, on the career side, of course, it's a lot messier and more difficult just because of the diversity. Uh, nobody's thought about construct definition here. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. in response to stresses, um, there's no academic readiness. Um, so perhaps just reopening these vocational programs in high school would be a good outcome, but um, that seems more worried if the stress only tracks students in these different fields, the schools have too much um, power to yeah. yeah, point That point is well taken. And uh, yeah, the idea of the comprehensive high school is a good idea and it seems to have worked sometimes in some places. And yes, we've sort of dismantled that and moved toward a, a more academic focus. <coughs> and um, there, there are a lot of big risks that would need to be considered here. If the uh, it's not going to be a massive incentive effect. If the college and career readiness indicator Call it as 20% of the API uh, that cuts it down by a factor of five. All the students in a high school or in an academic track are likely to be satisfying this indicator in pretty much the way they are now. So it's an even smaller set of school students we're looking at. And it's unlikely that we're going to be looking at the full 200 to 1,000 range. If most stu schools students are somewhere in the middle on that range, it's, it's, a, it's a much smaller impact on the API. And finally, the, it's an important sort of maybe a saving grace is that all of the incentive structures for the API are based on um, change from year to year. So it's only the, the, the growth that, that's going to make a difference. And whatever is locked in from one year to the next should, should basically just washes out. All that said, yes, we are creating incentives and people will probably overreact to them. They usually do. We'll see. David. Uh, you made a somewhat specific comment about data dashboards. And it seems to me that California is moving towards a more dashboard-like accountability system with the low level goal accountability plan and so on. I'm just curious as to sort of your, your reason for uh, not thinking that a dashboard would be better than an index. Uh, first of all, for the legislative purposes that the decile ranks have been serving, I think that it's just too complicated. More generally, I think that there's 
sometimes too much concern with the graphics and not enough concern with what actual precise decisions different kinds of data are supposed to inform, what anyone is supposed to do with the dashboard. Um, I've just seen uh, instances where good systems for providing information on student performance have, with all good intentions, have just not found much use in classrooms because people don't know what to do with them. But I should perhaps not have been quite so dismissive. But um, I'm, I'm just, I'll, I've, I, I haven't seen one that I really thought was doing a good job, but I haven't looked very hard. So. The sticking point for CELT has always been that it's not a, quote, universal indicator. There are a lot of schools that have no English learners. There are other schools that have many English learners. We accommodate that demographic diversity through the numerically significant subgroups and the API scores for those subgroups. I suppose, in principle, one could have a CELT only for the English learner subgroup, but that would be a, a real departure from the overall structure of the API. We've tried to keep things keep it a measure using, try, try to keep it uh, to measures that at least all the kids at a given grade level would take. Uh, so that, that's the, the, main, the main reason. Yeah, yeah. It would be, it would be possible to um, incorporate the cell to, for those students for whom it's required, uh, that would mean that the, te the overall API was measuring a different construct depending upon the proportions of kids who are English learners. It's already measuring a slightly different construct depending on the proportion of kids who are fifth graders, for example. So theor theoretically, I could make the case that it's not that big a leap, but it really does seem different. And it would uh, differentially affect schools in different parts of the achievement spectrum, so it would probably distort the scaling of the API a little bit, too. We do pay attention to things like standard errors. We bootstrap them, and we you know, look at stability over time, and there's a lot of fine-tuning and a lot of attention to, to those rules, but it's, it, that's really around the edges. Ben? Uh, I think there was not as much discussion as there should have been when the API was first created. It seemed self-evident that academic performance index would be based on test scores. The only test that was available was the SAT-9. Everybody knew that was a bad test, not aligned to the frameworks, the curriculum frameworks that were just coming online at that time. So the plan was to get something in place right away and then as you saw, we, we set it up in such a way that we could transition pretty smoothly to the California standards tests as they became available. Uh, since then, we've sort of pushed back on attempts to bring other kinds of things into the API that might be good things for schools to do but aren't really academic. But um, there's, there has not been a sort of searching evaluation of what the construct really, the intended construct really is. Uh, when constructing these things, do you think about ELs differently than other subgroups? In the sense that, so if I'm in the white subgroup, I'm pretty much going to stay in that subgroup, even though it's not promising regardless of the skill level at the time. But the ELs and sort of population experience and attrition or high performance students are also leaving that subgroup. I mean, would you think about that differently when you're constructing these kinds of measures? Uh, obviously, that's a big problem for, the, for NCLB where we have a requirement that this group that's constantly turning over with high performers leaving to become redesignated fully English proficient, or RFEP, and new uh, non-native speakers coming into the group constantly to get that group up to 100% proficient is a very different challenge. 
versus a group that at least has the same people in it over time. So if, as you know, in, under NCLB, there are more special rules and wrinkles to try to take care of that, like treating students as part of the EL group after redesignation until they've scored proficient at least three years uh, on, on, on the English language arts component of the CST, which means in effect that we're sort of delaying the inevitable, but we're greatly reducing that effect. It doesn't come up for the um, API because so long as schools are in a steady state uh, with the same level of turnover year after year, that perf the performance of that subgroup will be the same year after year. So it's, um, there are growth targets for the EL group. Um, and they will, of course, become more stringent as the school as a whole moves toward 800. But uh, no, there really hasn't, hasn't been that as much sustained attention to that question as there probably should be. Uh, <clears throat> yes, high, grades don't enter in anywhere. And since this is a school accountability program and grades are under the control of the school, it would be hard to find a way to bring grades in that wouldn't uh, invite even more grade inflation. Um, for the uh, college and career readiness scale, using some version of grades might be a possibility. But again, I, I think that it's it's unlikely people are going to trust it. Um, but um, people trust almost anything other than a test score. They sure trust that. Well, your point's well taken. Yeah. So it's a, I had an undergrad, was an advisor for an undergraduate years ago. Uh, his name was Eric. And at points like this, he would say, this would be yet another time when they didn't ask Eric. And <laughs> so, so I'll just... I'll paraphrase and say this would be another time when they didn't ask us. So. <laughs>